Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to learn the types of immunological blood transfusion reactions. I will first explain the different reactions and then we'll solve questions so that our knowledge on this topic is complete. If you're interested in medical videos, quizzes, interviews with doctors, and many other things related to medicine, do subscribe to my channel. You can also find me on Instagram. The first one on our list is anaphylactic reaction. This reaction takes place within seconds of transfusing blood. Anaphylactic reaction to blood transfusion happens in individuals who have IgA deficiency. Since the recipient doesn't have IgA, they produce IgA antibodies. These antibodies attack the IgA in the donor's blood. This results in anaphylactic features like hypotension, wheezing, and angioedema. The second one is acute hemolytic reaction. This takes place within the first 24 hours of transfusing blood. The main reason for acute hemolytic reaction is ABO incompatibility. If a patient who is B positive receives blood from patient who is A positive, the antibodies will attack the red blood cells and cause hemolysis. Common symptoms are flank pain, fever, and hemoglobinuria. Severe cases can also progress to DIC. The third one is the most common transfusion reaction. Can you guess which one it is? It is febrile non-hemolytic reaction. This reaction is likely to take place between 1 to 6 hours after transfusion. When blood is stored, some white blood cells release cytokines. When transfused, these cytokines trigger the immune system of the recipient's body. This results in symptoms of headache, fever, and chills. If a patient presents with urticaria after blood transfusion, it is likely due to an urticarial reaction. This takes place between 2 to 3 hours from transfusing blood. IgE plays an important role in this reaction. Transfusion-related acute lung injury occurs to 6 hours after transfusion. The donor's blood contains anti-leukocyte antibodies. When blood is transfused, the anti-leukocyte antibodies attack the lungs. So, if there are symptoms of respiratory distress and pulmonary edema after transfusion, don't forget to add transfusion-related acute lung injury to your differential. These are the main things that can happen in the first day of transfusion. Within days to weeks of transfusion, hemolysis can occur. This time, it is called delayed hemolytic reaction. The mechanism of this condition involves anamnestic antibodies. These are antibodies that are formed against minor antigens on red blood cells. The last one is transfusion-related graft-versus-host disease. This takes place within weeks of transfusion. Patients could present with pancytopenia, rash, fever, and GI symptoms. Now that we have a fair idea of the different transfusion reactions, let's solve questions to apply what we've learned. Question number one. A patient begins to wheeze three minutes after receiving a blood transfusion. Which of the following is least likely to be associated with our patient's condition? Option A, asthma. Option B, IgA nephropathy. Option C, celiac disease. The answer to this question is IgA nephropathy. This patient's wheeze almost immediately after transfusion indicates an anaphylactic reaction. This takes place in patients who have an IgA deficiency. IgA deficiency is common in people with celiac disease. If you want to learn more about celiac disease, click the link right here. IgA deficiency is associated with atopic conditions like eczema and asthma. IgA deficiency also increases the risk of giardia infection. IgA nephropathy involves the deposition of immune complexes with IgA in the mesangium of the kidney. This condition is not associated with IgA deficiency. Question number two. Four hours after blood transfusion, a patient develops fever. He also complains of headache and chills. Bilirubin is within the normal range. How could this have been prevented? Option A, double checking the ABO compatibility before transfusing. Option B, leukoreduction. Option C, irradiation. Option D, washing. The answer to this question is leukoreduction. 
Fever within six hours of transfusion, along with chills and headaches, points towards febrile non-hemolytic reaction. We learned that this takes place due to cytokine accumulation. Leukoreduction can be broken down into leuco and reduction. Leuco reminds me of white blood cells and reduction is decreasing. So, in the process of leukoreduction, we are almost removing all the white blood cells. In the absence of white blood cells, there will be no cytokines produced and released. Hence, febrile non-hemolytic reaction can be prevented. This is done for recipients who are chronically transfused and for individuals who are at a risk of CMV infection. Transplant recipients would also benefit from leukoreduction. Bilirubin levels will be high in case of hemolysis. Normal bilirubin levels in our patient helps us rule out ABO incompatibility. Blood is irradiated before transfusing it to people who have cellular immune deficiencies or are bone marrow transplant recipients. It is done to prevent graft versus host disease. Washed blood removes proteins like anti-IgA antibodies, so it is preferred for patients with IgA deficiency. Question number three. After receiving blood transfusion, a patient develops rash and fever. He also complains of diarrhea. His red blood cell levels are low. Coombs test is negative. Which of the following is primarily involved in the pathogenesis of his condition? Option A, neutrophils. Option B, IgG antibodies. Option C, recipient's T-cells. Option D, donor's T-cells. The answer to this question is donor's T-cells. This patient is likely to have transfusion-associated graft versus host disease. The T-cells from the donor's blood attack the recipient's bone marrow. This leads to pancytopenia. Neutrophils are involved in transfusion-related acute lung injury. The anti-leukocyte antibodies trigger neutrophils and lead to respiratory distress. The absence of lung symptoms in this patient helps us rule this out. IgG antibodies are involved in acute hemolytic and delayed hemolytic reactions. Although these can cause anemia, a negative Coombs test can help us rule these conditions out. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up to support my channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do because all my videos are for free. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.